Hello, everybody, and welcome to May's edition of St. John's Cancer Institute's Be Inspired Speaker Series, Game Changing Technologies for Brain Cancer. My name is Jean Goldsmith, and I'm a Development Director at St. John's Health Center Foundation. St. John's Cancer Institute, our name as of January 2021, sounds new to some of you, as you've known us as the John Wayne Cancer Institute for many years. At the end of 2020, the licensing agreement allowing Providence St. John's to use the name and likeness of John Wayne on the Institute and the fellowship program expired. Going forward, the Institute will now be known as St. John's Cancer Institute. The name is in the, excuse me, the change is in name only. It will not impact the Institute's operations in any way. And the fellowship program will now carry the name of the physician who founded the Institute and be called the Donald L. Morton Complex General Surgical Oncology Fellowship Program. St. John's Cancer Institute will continue to provide excellence in research, education, and cancer care through innovative clinical trials and laboratory research, the education of the next generation of surgical oncologists and scientists, and of course, our state-of-the-art treatment for our patients. Going forward, we will expand and deepen the focus of our main pillars of cancer research, immunotherapy, genomics, and precision medicine. Before we get started today, I want to give you information that will help you ask questions of our speakers. As you will notice, everyone but the presenters are muted so that we will be able to hear them well. In order to ask questions, which we hope that you will do, you will need to use the chat function on, the, on your screen. The chat function looks like a thought bubble and it's located on the bottom of your screen. We will see your question and Dr. Martin will ask the physician. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will follow up in an email to you with your, with your answer. If you have a question after the webinar, please email us and we will get that answer to you. You can find our email address on any of the emails that we have sent to you. Just please reply to those emails and we'll get those. We have a very interesting hour in front of us as we will hear from neuro-oncologists, neurosurgeons, and a translational research scientist about new technologies in brain cancer treatment and research. Unfortunately, Dr. Kayseri will not be joining us today. He had an emergency and in our business, that always comes first. So I'm very honored to introduce the panel today. Dr. Garni Barkadarian is a neurosurgeon at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. He is also the co-director of the Pituitary Disorders Center, the director of the Adult Hydrocephalus Center, director of the Facial Pain Center, chief of the radio surgery program at PNI and director of the St. John's Cancer Institute and PNI Microdissection Anatomy Laboratory. Dr. Barkadarian, you have involvement in a lot of different uh, programs at PNI. What is the most exciting aspect of your work at this time? I think uh, the most exciting aspect is actually the people I work with. You know, we uh, have a very collaborative organization a multidisciplinary organization that connects us at a very a close level with experts that uh, we can contact with regards to the care of our patients, with regards to research that we're doing, with regards to uh, advancing some of the uh, knowledge and literature uh, that's out there in neuro-oncology. It's been very exciting the last 10 years and looking forward to the next 20, 30. That's great, thank you very much. And Dr. Navid Wagal is a Wagale is a board certified uh, psychi in psychiatry and neurology, and is a neurooncologist at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. His primary focus is on cancers of the peripheral and central nervous systems, and primary and metastatic brain tumors. And he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in clinical trials design and implementation. Dr. Wagale, how has your clinical trials work enhanced your clinical your clinical practice? I think the clinical trials are a key component of what we're doing in brain cancer treatment options. Uh, obviously, this is a difficult journey for many patients, and so we are looking to improve that journey, not just in length of or in quantity of life, but also in quality of life as well. And so my goal is to develop new and innovative ways to make that journey longer and better for everyone that I come in contact with. That's great, thank you. And, and we do have 
quite a few clinical trials going. So we're looking forward to hearing uh, about the work that you're doing. Um, our, our third panelist is Dr. Alex Wazinski. He's a senior translational research scientist with the Department of Translational Neurosciences and Neurotherapeutics at Pacific Neuroscience Institute. Dr. Wazinski, can you tell us a little about the work that you do at PNI? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, we, uh, so I've been working with uh, Dr. Kisri um, for almost three years now, and uh, we're trying to implement new tools uh, to try to understand better brain tumors and, uh, and their development, and also how those tumors uh, respond to treatment. And we use this knowledge to design new therapeutic approach with the ultimate goal is to improve um, patient outcome. So, and we're doing that with uh, a lot of really brilliant people in the lab, and uh, I'm really glad to collaborate with these people as well. That's great. And what's and and we'll really hear more about what Dr. Barkadarian was talking about in terms of working the collaborative work that you all do, you know, so closely together for the patient's benefit. That's great. And moderating today is Dr. Neil Martin. Uh, he's the interim executive director of the St. John's Cancer Institute. He is also a neurosurgeon and, and is the regional medical director of neuroscience for Providence, Southern California, overseeing neurosciences for Providence hospitals and clinics across all of Southern California. Take it away, Dr. Martin. Thank you, Gene. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, my outstanding colleagues. You know, it really is a team sport to take care of patients with complex brain tumors. And we've got some of the uh, most highly trained and most capable specialists in each of these different areas, medical oncology, biomedical science, neurosurgery, uh, and other members of the team in radiation oncology and other specialties. So it's a pleasure to work in such a highly integrated, high quality team for the care of the patients in our community who have brain tumors. Let me start with this one for Dr. For Dr. Barkadarian, you know, we, you hear the term brain tumor, but what exactly does that mean? There's several different kinds of brain tumors, Dr. Barkadarian, and it's often confusing to people. Can you break that down for us? Yeah, great question, Dr. Martin. Um, you know, the first thing is uh, what type of tumor is it? And we can categorize them into broad categories, but primarily we divide them into benign tumors and malignant tumors. So brain tumors that are not very aggressive or brain tumors that can be highly aggressive or cancerous. Um, that said, we can also divide the tumors up as to where they originate from. So sometimes brain tumors originate from the brain tissue itself. The, those are um, often what we call primary brain tumors and uh, they can still be benign or malignant. They can originate from the, the structures that surround the brain. So this, these can include the nerves, the coverings of the, uh, the skull, the bone itself, and these could be benign or malignant as well. It does change how we approach them because uh, from a surgical and even from a medical perspective, they behave differently. And then finally, we can have tumors that come from elsewhere. They come from outside the brain or the uh, central nervous system, and they get into the uh, brain. And these would be called metastatic tumors, which are typically cancerous and uh, can be uh, somewhat aggressive, but are treated in a very different approach, still a multidisciplinary approach, but we have to use a different strategy to get to these. Great. Uh, Dr. Wigley, how, how do we diagnose brain tumors? How, how does a person discover that they have a brain tumor? Well, typically uh, these are found because patients present with a variety of symptoms. Uh, in the brain, it's typically a neurologic symptom, such as weakness or numbness or confusion. And sometimes it's uh, just a persistent, unrelenting headache that warrants the further investigation. The first step is usually that they're evaluated for these symptoms. And sometimes that's with imaging, an MRI scan or a CT scan. And then we see that there is a mass or, or something in the brain. And then we work together with myself and, and Dr. Markadarian and the neurosurgery team to decide if we need to take a piece of that to make a, a definitive diagnosis. And oftentimes that is one of the first steps as well. But, and, and that's, that's usually how we make these diagnoses. But we're starting to kind of shift 
And speaking of game changing technologies, one of the things that we're really looking at is making these diagnoses either upfront, meaning uh, at the initial time, or maybe down the road after some treatment to see if there's response by using a thing called a liquid biopsy. The liquid biopsy is kind of the new future where we're using blood samples or fluid samples and not necessarily an invasive procedure to see if we can detect tumor cells and also characterize some of the, the genetics of that as well. And one of the things that we're doing that's kind of pioneering in this is something that Dr. Wojcicki is going to talk about uh, is the single cell technology as well. And that's something that we're finding here. It's probably uh, one of the things that will change the future of how we make these diagnoses. So instead of necessarily how we're doing it now with uh, going in and getting a pitch, piece of the tissue out, it could be that in the future we get a sample of blood and we can make a diagnosis of what we're seeing uh, based on that as well. So that, that the concept of the liquid biopsy is fascinating. Dr. Wojcicki, how can you make the diagnosis of a brain tumor from a blood test? You may be on mute, Dr. Wojcicki. I'm sorry. Um, yes, so some of the, the feature of brain tumor can be found in the blood. And for instance, we can find some circulating tumor cells present in the blood or in cerebrospinal fluid that can be extremely useful to try to determine what kind of brain tumor we are dealing with. Um, in addition, we have some modification of some molecules that can be found in the blood that are also highly relevant for the diagnostic of a brain tumor. And uh, that would be, as Dr. Wagley was saying, uh, that would be a game changer for, for brain tumor diagnostic and also treatment because we can monitor closely in a non-invasive way um, how those tumor form and develop and also how they respond to treatment. Dr. Barkadarian, you know, we, we, we've got a question here about surgery for meningiomas, but I want to ask you, what's, what, what are the goals of surgery? What can be accomplished with surgery for the different kinds of tumors you described? Specific for meningioma or just in general? We'll start with meningioma. That's a that's a common uh, operation that we do, and then uh, the other touch on the other types of tumors sure. as well. Sure. So first of all, um, it's important to, as we talked about, separate out the different types of meningiomas. Um, the vast majority of meningiomas are benign; they're not cancerous tumors. Very rarely are they aggressive or, or cancerous. And so, uh, and because we're getting MRIs much more easily than we used to um, about 10 or 15 years ago, we're starting to see many, many patients who have small asymptomatic inconsequential meningiomas. And quite frankly, had they not had the MRI, you would not know about them. Um, and so the vast majority of meningiomas don't really need any intervention at all, uh, no surgery or anything else. We typically monitor these. A minority of these will grow and cause problems. That said, and of course, what we do is take care of those that are causing problems. So as meningiomas grow, and they may take a while to grow, may even take 5, 10, 20 years to get to a point that can cause a problem, they start to push on the normal brain. They don't really invade the brain often. They're pushing on the normal brain and displacing their structures. And at some point, it reaches a tipping point and uh, starts to cause symptoms. And depending on the location, um, it could be anywhere from a headache uh, to memory difficulties to difficulty with some of the nerves that go to the face, like it can affect vision or uh, speech. Um, and so all of those things can occur. And when we see those, the goal is then to go after the tumor and remove it as safely as possible. And what we do at the Pacific Neuroscience Institute is employ a minimally invasive approach to these types of tumors. We can use natural, natural orifices, uh, like going through the nose um, or behind the ear um, or through the eyebrow um, or other minimally invasive ways to get to these difficult to reach tumors. And with our technologies we have in the operating room, we're able to uh, take these tumors out in a maximally safe way uh, such that uh, they can decrease the pressure on the brain, allow for the symptoms to improve. And the, the majority of the time that really takes care of the problem. Right. 
Uh, you know, just to go on to meningiomas, because we have this question uh, about non-invasive treatment. Uh, so you, you, you uh, stated that many small meningiomas grow very slowly or not at all and never have to be treated. Monitoring means getting an MRI scan periodically. If it doesn't grow, leave it alone. And that, you know, that's, just, that's, the, that's the least invasive approach. Uh, maybe we'll be able to do that monitoring with blood tests in the future. But Dr. Wagley, when a meningioma needs treatment and surgery is not appropriate, uh, how could we treat meningiomas non-invasively? Well, there are several different options actually. Uh, so surgery is typically the first line and that helps us with making the diagnosis obviously, but it is a great treatment in itself and has the best outcomes even uh, in, in patients that need the surgery. And I agree with Dr. Markman, most of these are benign and don't require further treatment. But obviously as a neuro-oncologist, I see the ones that don't behave normally. And so we have treatment options that we are exploring and that may be with different types of immunotherapy or chemotherapy agents um, or targeted therapy agents. Dr. One of our colleagues is recently publishing a paper on where we treated them with a combination of targeted agents that have shown tremendous outcomes as well. And I just submitted a, a paper with, with another one of my colleagues showing that we treated the patient with recurrent, meaning uh, a meningioma that wasn't responding to prior therapies and causing a lot of neuro symptoms with a combination regimen that had uh, unprecedented response, so a near complete resolution. And so we're just uh, writing that up right now and submitting that as well for publication. But the bottom line is that if the meningiomas do come back, there's a combination of chemotherapy and targeted therapies that can be considered. And a lot of that goes back to what we were discussing earlier was understanding the tumor. Uh, first. And so understanding the tumor, meaning the extent, what grading, the pathology information. But now we're also shifting to understanding the genetics of the tumor itself. So what caused this tumor to form? What were the mutations in the DNA or, or in the molecules that caused this to form? And how can we target those? How can we stop that particular thing from growing? So we're personalizing this regimen to, to the genetics of the tumor itself. I think that is how we're going to change uh, recurrent meningioma therapies. And that's what we're doing right now, actually. Yeah. Terrific. So targeting means uh, using drugs that are specifically directed against the DNA mutations that are causing the tumor to grow. Is that right? That's correct. So we are now able to, to sequence the DNA so we can get these meningioma cells and we can tell what the DNA is. We know what the normal ones are. And so we can see what has changed and what we, we know is causing this to, to grow. And so there are therapies or drugs or infusions um, that we have that can particularly target that. And so we select those on an individual basis. Well, we're getting several questions about malignant brain tumors and glioblastoma, but before we move on, Dr. Barkadarian, tell us about what's been called bloodless brain surgery or stereotactic radiosurgery. What exactly is that? Yeah, great question. And, and it is uh, a major part of our armamentarium to take care of our patients with various types of brain tumors and brain cancers and apply it in various ways. The concept is, say this is a tumor, and we can remove the, a lot of it or it's treated medically, but we still have some left behind. Um, we would target this with high energy x-rays or gamma rays coming in from all different directions. So this is the stereotactic way, three dimensions to come in and the tumor gets a big dose and dies or stops growing. And the remaining brain gets a much, much lower dose. And uh, for the vast majority of tumors, I would say 95, 97% of tumors, this is quite effective in stopping the growth or, or even reversing its, its progression. And um, here at St. John's, we have one of the most accurate frameless systems, so we don't have to put pins in people's heads anymore, uh, to be able to do this safely and with our expert team uh, accomplish this very effectively. 
Yeah, I know you're an expert in this field, Dr. Barkadari, and you've done hundreds of brain tumors with stereotactic radio surgery. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, we just have a, we have a, before we go to glioblastomas, uh, we have a question about uh, cerebellar tumors. And, you know, if I can, if I can answer, uh, you know, it really depends on the type of cerebellar tumor, whether or not there are non-invasive options for treating it. There are, in some cases, it might include chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and it may include stereotactic radiosurgery as, as Dr. Barkadarian does. Um, I know that in the question, there's a reference about compromise of quality of life from the treatment of a cerebellar tumor. And that certainly is not out of the question in with modern microsurgical technique, it's unusual. For instance, the patient that Dr. Kelly and I operated on last Wednesday, who had a cerebellar hemangioblastoma, went home on Saturday, uh, completely normal. And the tumor was completely removed and cured. Now this is a benign tumor. You know, benign doesn't mean it's harmless. It means it it's, doesn't spread throughout the brain uh, to distant areas. It doesn't metastasize. It doesn't infiltrate the brain, but glioblastomas do. Dr. Wagley, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the diagnosis of glioblastoma? Sure. Glioblastoma is a aggressive primary brain cancer. What that is, is a cancer that starts in the brain and typically stays in the brain, but it grows uh, aggressively. And because it's in the brain, obviously it causes compromise of neurologic function. Again, that can be cognitive thinking process, memory processes, strength or, or, or ability to walk. Um, and sometimes they're even in the cerebellum. It can cause cerebellar symptoms as was brought up by one of our uh, attendees. Um, the diagnosis is done typically by uh, a surgical intervention. So the reason that we do that is, as Dr. Barkadarian can further explain, the surgery remains one of the best treatment options for glioblastoma. And so we do want to try and implore that because all the other therapies that come afterwards, whether that be radiation therapy or chemotherapy or targeted therapy, work essentially better if there's less tumor there. The diagnosis uh, that we're trying to establish is one where uh, we can see the pathology, the pathologies of the actual tumor cells. But what is changing is we're learning more about different types of glioblastoma, and that's based on the genetics of the tumor itself. So essentially here at PNI, we are genetically characterizing every uh, glioblastoma so that we understand the genetics specific to that one. Uh, and that carries with it different treatment options, uh, but also kind of a better understanding of what is the likelihood of this progressing in different areas? What uh, is the prognosis associated with some of these genetic features? And so the diagnosis of what it is, is one thing, but how did it get there? And, and what do we do about it is the next part of the diagnosis that, we, that we're uh, moving forward with. So what would you say are the, the, the most promising treatment strategies, the most promising advances today in the treatment of glioblastoma. Most of them grow back, don't they? Yeah, most of them do grow back. And so that's why we're constantly striving to, to come up with new ways of fighting this. The most promising that, that I think are out there right now are kind of two different avenues. Well, maybe three. The first one is using a immunotherapy. So immunotherapy is trying to elicit the immune system to help in the fight against cancer. It has been shown to be very effective in other types of cancers, such as melanoma, uh, lung cancers. And so we wanna see if we can use the immune system to fight brain cancers as well. And so using different immunotherapies, meaning different ways of stimulating the immune system is one avenue. And then another is called precision or targeted therapy. So based on the profiles that we see of the genetics of the tumor, we can develop a treatment plan that's specifically targeting those pathways as well. And that's called a, a targeted therapy. And currently we have clinical trials that are investigating both of these pathways. So we have an immunotherapy trial and we have targeted therapy trials. And the, the newest one that we're developing in collaboration with Dr. Markadarian is using intraoperative radiation therapy. So we're trying to bring that kind of radiation 
uh, for, into the operating room so that we can use more targeted, more precise radiation therapy, as well as lower doses. So this, the radiation that we're currently using is, uses external beams, and so it shoots through the brain, whereas this is going to be a new way of, of using that radiation specifically to the areas that we want. Terrific. So major promise with immunotherapy, certainly. We've seen um, almost 50% almost a, a of people with melanoma, which used to be a death sentence, responding fantastically well to immunotherapy. And we're looking forward to a time when that can apply to glioblastomas as well. Dr. Wojcicki, you're using some of the most advanced biomedical and scientific techniques to study tumor cells and tumor cell gene genetic abnormalities. How is that going to help us develop new treatments and new diagnostic techniques for brain tumors? So I think, um, as Dr. Bakularian was uh, was saying, we have different type of brain tumors and. Um, and even within the same type of brain tumors, those tumors can be really different at the molecular level from one patient to another. That would explain why um, some patient might respond to one treatment and uh, other patients don't. Um, so it's extremely important to understand what those tumors are at the molecular level. And, uh, we can, ask, uh, we can add another level of complexity in this tumor is mainly those brain tumors and the majority of tumor in general are not formed by, the cell, by only one cell type. Um, those tumors are composed of several types of tumor cells, but they also interact with healthy cells that are hijacked by those tumor cells and help them grow. So having a deeper understanding on what the composition of this tumor is, uh, is a, would be a great uh, a game changer to design new therapeutic approach. So we can target specifically one cell type. And if we are able to get rid of one cell type, can we use another drug to get rid of the other cell type? And we're going to have a, a better way to, um, to, uh, to um, treat those, uh, those tumors. Um, and now with all the technology that we have, um, that we can actually have a deep understanding and, uh, and characterize um, those tumors at the single cell level is giving us a tremendous um, uh, amount of data that we can use to design new, new yeah. strategy. This is such critical work because we don't have a guaranteed cure for glioblastomas now. But exactly this kind of research over the last couple of decades is what has rendered many melanomas now curable. And we hope to have the same thing for glioblastoma. You know, much of that work for melanoma has been done right here at the St. John's Cancer Institute uh, by our incredible basic science team and our, and our clinicians. Uh, Dr. Barkadarian, there's a question here about uh, pilocytic astrocytoma and how that could possibly recur after surgery. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Presumably complete resection. Yeah, so pilocytic astrocytomas are thought to be benign tumors. And uh, the goal of surgery is to try to cure the patient because if you can take it all out, you can potentially cure the patient. In some cases, even though it may look like you've got it all out on an MRI or visually in the operating room, uh, sometimes microscopic cells may be left behind. And if it's in part of a brain that we can't take that few millimeters of tissue because uh, that's really critical structures, very eloquent brain tissue as, we as they call it, then we have to respect those planes. And in some cases, those cells can come back. Now, the good news is more recently, we found that uh, not a small minority of patients with pilocytic astrocytoma have a specific mutation called the BRAF mutation. And there is a drug for that that didn't exist five, 10 years ago. And we can, in select patients, effectively cure them with that medication after the surgery has been done. So there are some new options out there, even for this benign tumor. Terrific. So that's a, that's a sterling example of targeted therapy. If we know with driving the tumor growth, and we can direct a drug at that molecular target, we can shut it down. 
Um, Dr. Wagley, can you bring us up to date on the status of vaccine trials for glioblastoma? We're hearing more and more about tumor vaccines for, for different types of uh, cancer. What's the deal with glioblastoma? That's a great question. And, and I think vaccines are at the forefront of everyone's attention right now, given the, the pandemic and, and the need to get everyone vaccinated to protect against that. Um, again, vaccines elicit the immune system to do the dirty work, essentially. It gets rid of the disease that you want to, to get rid of. Vaccines in, in COVID, for example, get the body to recognize the coronavirus and it allows the immune system to, instead of get sick, to easily deal with that. That's what we're trying to do with glioblastoma as well. So we're different, we're pioneering different types of vaccines uh, from dendritic cells to the stem cell vaccines where we're getting the immune system revved up and, and uh, primed to recognize the cancer and treat it. The main issue with the immune response to cancer is the cancers arise from your own body. They're part of your brain. And so in many uh, instances, the immune system doesn't recognize them as something that it needs to deal with. It recognizes them as part of the self and it just lets them go about their business essentially. The goal with these vaccines is to elicit, to get the immune system to at least recognize that this is not normal. This is not part of the body. And so obviously evolution has shown that the immune system is tremendous at getting rid of foreign entities. So if we get the immune system to recognize the cancer as a foreign entity, it will probably be the best way to, to get rid of that as well. So the, the techniques for developing these vaccines are variable. We've learned a lot through these COVID trials, including the ones that we ran here at, at St. John's Cancer Institute to help in the pandemic, uh, that there are different ways of developing vaccines. And so we are now uh, initiating trials. We've had trials for like, uh, dendritic cell vaccines, but we're initiating trials now for new vaccine therapy options as well. And so we're, we're working with our basic science colleagues to kind of develop those uh, new methods as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Barkadarian, there's some pretty amazing technologies that you use in the operating room to find deep tumors, to identify the difference between glioblastoma cells and normal brain. What, what, what are the techniques that you find most useful today in the operating room? Yeah, we've really made some tremendous uh, advances even in the last five, 10 years in this realm. And, and it all boils down to seeing the tumor. It's all about visualization and seeing the tumor. And what we employ at St. John's and PNI is a multimodality approach to looking and identifying tumor. So we start with a high level MRI. So we know exactly where the tumor is and we use kind of a GPS system in the operating room to fuse that MRI to, to our computers and we know exactly where to go. So that's step one. And we use uh, a number of modalities uh, to see it once we're looking through the microscope. So we can use an ultrasound. An ultrasound can differentiate between normal brain and abnormal brain. And that can really be very helpful in uh, uh, guiding our trajectory and making sure that we got it all out. Also, we've been utilizing um, a, a special types of dyes. Some basically, it's kind of like tumor paint or a dye. You inject it through a vein or you take it orally and we can differentiate between what's abnormal and what's normal brain. And sometimes these tumors under white light look identical to normal brain. So this is a tremendous improvement. And not only is it safer and, and prevents us from straying out into no, in normal and important brain, but it's also lets us speed things up in the operating room because we don't have to keep biopsying and figuring out is this tumor or is this normal? So that's extremely helpful. And then finally, we've employed the use of an endoscope. So it used to be that we'd operate through a hole and we'd have to make the hole big enough so that the microscope's light can get through and we can see everything. Well, now we can make that hole much smaller and we'll still use a microscope, but then we can introduce an endoscope, much like in a knee arthroscopy, look around the corners and remove that tumor that we couldn't see in a straight line of sight. Makes the opening smaller, makes less collateral damage to the brain and the soft tissue, and we feel as a result 
these patients do better. They are able to go home sooner with less complications and a quicker return to normal life. Yeah, I've, I've been, you know, I've been very impressed in my year here at uh, St. John's Health Center and in PNI with the expertise that you and Dr. Kelly employ using the endoscope. It really, you all really are masters of this and I've become a real believe, believer in these kinds of minimally invasive approaches. It's wonderful to see patients going home in one or two or three days, which we never thought was possible after brain surgery in the past. Dr. Wojcinski, um, what, you know, you're using some amazing technological devices and techniques to learn more about tumor cells and the immune system. Tell, tell us about some of the newest techniques. So there are different ones. Uh, so um, um, what we usually, uh, what we used to do for those tumor is to take the entire tumor and try to sequence. So as Dr. Wogley was saying, we can have some information about the genetics of the tumor. You can have some information about uh, the molecule this tumor is secreting. Uh, now we can use some new technology where instead of having an average of what's going on in this tumor, we can look at the single cell level what cells is mutated, what's, what is this each cell is secreting. So we're using some technology from different um, company. Uh, one, one of those would be um, the Tanex Genomics where we can use this machine that can separate each cell type and we can have a deep uh, sequencing of every single cell and try to understand the composition of those, uh, of those cells. Um, we recently acquired this uh, machine called the, the nanostring, the, um, uh, the form nanostring that can actually do the same exact job on a slice of tumor. And we can analyze the composition of each cell type, but also located them within the tumor. Are they more on the margin? Are they locating more in the blood vessels? So it's giving us a lot of information about um, the composition of these cells, which is crit critical to, to develop new, new treatments. Terrific, yeah, these, I've been very, very impressed with some of the, some of the uh, technologies that you have shown me that I've seen Dr. Hoon uh, demonstrate. Uh, you know, the Cancer Institute here at St. John's is really employing some of the, some of the newest and latest uh, technologies to gain new insights into cancer, not only in the brain, but throughout the body. You know, Dr. Wagley, we have a question from Ann about oligodendroglioma tumors. So what are these? Are they benign? Are they malignant? How are they treated? Give us some background on that particular type of tumor. Right, an oligodendroglioma, uh, is again a primary brain cancer, so along the lines of glioblastoma, but an oligodendroglioma originates from a slightly different cell line. And what's really changed in the last few years is how we make the diagnosis of an oligodendroglioma. Previously, it was based mainly on what the pathologist saw, what did the cells look like, and what did they call it. Now the diagnosis of an oligodendroglioma is made on the genetics. So we know that oligodendrogliomas have a certain uh, pattern change in their chromosomes, and we can see that now. And so we make that diagnosis of an oligo based on that genetic pattern as well. Oligos can still vary from what we call a low-grade oligo, meaning uh, uh, one that's less aggressive, to an anaplastic oligo, slightly more aggressive. And depending on the genetics and the, the pathology, different treatments are implored for different uh, grading. So it really depends on the, the specifics that we see with our pathologists, with our research team, with our genetics team to help determine what's the right avenue for treatment, whether that be just surgery, whether that be radiation, whether that be uh, targeted or immunotherapy or chemotherapy. Um, it, it, takes kind of a collaboration between all the people you're seeing here and obviously the, the patients themselves to make that right decision on an individual level. Right, terrific. 
So we have a question about metastatic brain tumors. Dr. Wagley, while I have you, what, what, what type of cancers that originate elsewhere in the body travel to the brain, metastasize to the brain? Right. So while we're talking a lot about these primary brain tumors, 80% of all cancers in the brain actually originate from elsewhere in the body. The most common being the most common cancers, which are breast cancer and lung cancer, but many other cancers from melanoma to, to even the rarer cancer, sometimes even ovarian cancers, I saw that in the chat, um, can be metastatic to the brain. A metastatic tumor to the brain is characterized by um, originally from where the original tissue was from. And so we know, and we've studied that the, the profile of these tumors in the brain changes significantly to allow them to get out of where they were, whether that be the lung or elsewhere, into the bloodstream, and then get out of the bloodstream and, and lodge in the brain. Very few things want to stay in the brain. And so we're characterizing this kind of shift of the molecular profiling from the original site to to the brain as well. While lung and breast by far are the most common, um, many other cancers can do that. And so going back to what we initially discussed, these liquid biopsies are becoming uh, even more useful to, to better understand what's going on in the body that's allowing these cancers to, to get other places. And so we're seeing that the, sometimes the genetics changes, sometimes the treatment needs to change because of that as well. Uh, from what we were doing initially to how the genetics have changed now so that we come up with the right treatment plan as well. So uh, that's very helpful. Um, do most metastatic brain tumors require surgery or do they require radiation therapy or chemotherapy? What's, what's, what, what's most often employed to treat these tumors? Uh, myself and Dr. Barkin there and probably answer that. Uh, typically, it's based on symptoms. So symptoms and size, I would say. Symptoms and size. Typically, surgery and radiosurgery are probably the first line of therapies, uh, specifically for the brain. But um, we're developing new uh, additional options to that. I'll let Dr. Barkin there and talk to you about when surgery is the right option versus radiosurgery. Yeah, I mean, I think it's... Uh... Uh, important to distinguish uh, a number of factors. One is, you know, how is the patient doing overall? Assuming the patient is, is healthy and can tolerate surgery and the tumors are either causing significant symptoms or are quite large, then I think surgery has a role. And, and one of the good things is even though these tumors do invade into the brain, it still does displace much of the brain. So we could get the majority of metastatic tumors out relatively safely and the recovery is, is quite quick for the majority of patients. That said, we still need to um, augment our therapy with radiation because we can't get that margin. We know we are leaving microscopic cells behind even if the MRI looks perfect. And so therefore we do employ stereotactic radiosurgery. In some cases, we'll even do this before the surgery to help prime those cells so that they don't go elsewhere as we do the surgery. Uh, but those are, those are the typical tactics. Now, that said, um, we've had a number of patients, uh, I would say a minority of patients, but a, a growing number of patients um, over the last maybe five years who've had known metastatic disease with a known targeted um, mu mutation where there is a drug available for them. And sometimes that drug can penetrate into the brain. And in some cases, those tumors will shrink without any radiation or without any surgery. And so we're seeing some promising steps forward there. It's not every patient, but we are seeing some positive effects and anything we can do to minimize the risks to our patients, I think th that's the way to go. And it's really thanks to a lot of the efforts that have been done uh, with, by scientists like Dr. Wojcicki or and others in this world. That's great. So um, we heard brief mention of IORT, intraoperative radiation therapy. Why, why would you want to give radiation therapy in the operating room rather than with stereotactic radiosurgery or, or conventional radiotherapy after surgery? Why would that be better? Yeah, I mean, that's an important question. And there's two parts to it. One is about timing and the other is about collateral damage. 
Um, so I'll talk about the collateral damage first. Dr. Wagley already mentioned that typically when we take out these large aggressive malignant tumors like glioblastoma, we have to do a wide field of radiation that does affect a lot of the scalp, a lot of the, the um, soft tissue, the bone, and the brain to get to that area. And that's a little bit different than the stereotactic radiation we were talking about. So there is some collateral damage there. And so to be able to move that radiation to inside, you can avoid a lot of that collateral damage, especially if one needs to re-irradiate. And the second reason is timing. It's typically what happens is a patient needs surgery, they undergo surgery, they, let's, let's hope they do well and they leave the hospital in one or two days. It still takes about a couple of weeks for the wound to heal up nicely. And then we start planning for radiation and uh, get all the logistics for that. And it may be a month before the radiation can be delivered. And so if we can get that time shortened to zero days, that would be the best. And in some cases we can even augment that uh, with other medications that work synergistically with the radiation to have an immediate effect. The immunotherapy effect that Dr. Wagley mentioned can be kickstarted by the radiation and that can really help the body attack the, the tumor cells on its own and uh, be much more effective. So one thing we're employing and we're just about to roll out our clinical trial for this here at St. John's is uh, something called intraoperative radiation therapy. Now this isn't something new. This has been going on for a hundred years, but the delivery is different. It used to be we would put radioactive seeds into the brain and that would continually give radiation to a particular thickness of brain. What we have seen though, is that does result in collateral damage, collateral damage, and you just cannot control the amount of radiation that patient receives. You can't just go back in and remove them um, at the, at the uh, drop of a hat. So the idea is that we have an X-ray device that goes into the cavity after we've done the surgery and we deliver the radiation on the spot. We know what the dose is that the patient receives. We can control it to its correct depth and then we can remove it. And we don't have to worry that the patient has something ongoing in the brain. And at the same time, we prevented that collateral damage as best as possible by doing it directly to the tumor cavity. So hopefully, we'll see that not only will this be more effective in uh, taking care of our, our brain tumor patients, but hopefully with less complications. Great. You know, uh, Providence St. John's Health Center here in Santa Monica is one of the few comprehensive brain tumor centers capable of treating virtually every kind of brain tumor. What, t tell us a little bit about the unusual and rare kinds of brain tumors uh, that we see on a much more regular basis than uh, the average hospital would. Would you like me to start that off? Yep. Start that off, you know, chordomas, craniopharyngiomas. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so um, the, the tumors we've discussed so far are the common ones. Metastatic tumors, glioblastoma, meningiomas, those are quite common. Um, but we do see these uh, quite rare tumors. And um, because we're a center of excellence for these types of minimally invasive and skull-based tumors, and because we have a lot of experience in treating these, both surgically and medically, patients come to Pacific Neuroscience Institute and the uh, and St. John's for their care. So as a result, we're seeing some of these rare tumors like craniopharyngiomas, like chordomas, like chondrosarcomas, um, and, uh, and hemangioblastomas that Dr. Martin mentioned that usually an average surgeon may see once a year or once every five years, and, and we're seeing them continuously. And what does that allow us to do? Number one, the more you do something, um, the better you get at it. So the, the fact that we see a higher volume of these patients allows us to deliver the care well. But simultaneously, because we see these patients and because we get their tissue, we're able to analyze this. Our researchers at the St. John's Cancer Institute can help assess the genetics of it and help Dr. Wagley and his team direct, have targeted care for these patients. So as a result, we, ha we do have a clinical trial now for chordoma. Yeah. We do have clinical trial now for craniopharyngioma and we're, we're, we are offering these targeted therapies, which I think just are not available at most centers that do see only a handful of these over a five or 10 year period. Right. 
Yeah, oh, I think of that. We, we see so many of these and we're able to develop these trials here because we have uh, patients are coming to us for them. We have a tremendous uh, neurosurgery program. So they see them initially and, and, and then we come on board and, and develop these trials. We have one of the few uh, cordoma clinical trials in the nation because we just see enough cordoma patients to be able to develop a trial such as that, to, de to have the science that that we behind it to develop new therapies and new approaches to to kind of develop a new trial and offer that to patients and part of that is because we have a huge um bank of of tumor cells from patients as well as uh spinal fluid that we're able to do a lot of the science the science is kind of the backbone of everything else that we're doing so in order to be able to develop these new therapies that Dr. Wojcicki was talking about, we need to be able to, to characterize enough of them to get a, a real sense of what a potential therapy would look like, and then get it to the point where we are now, where we're offering this as a therapy for, for patients. Yeah, that's terrific. You know, I, there are a couple other questions that have come through. Well, we're going to answer every question with a response of one form or another. Before we uh, come to the end of our hour, I wanted to ask Dr. Wojcicki and, and Dr. Wiley, what, what new technology out there is gonna enable us to make a quantum leap in the treatment of brain tumors? What technology uh, is, is in process, is being developed, uh, is in early stages that is right at the frontier of science that would greatly amplify our efforts in the Cancer Institute? Alex? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I would say um, what the most important thing right now is that all those technology are, are creating a huge amount of data. Um, and right now, I think most of the work is going to be to try to understand those data and put them all together and, and combine those data from different centers all around the world. And, and be able to do this bioinformatic work that give us more and more um, 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 insights in, in those brain tumors. And I think that's where the challenge was a couple of years ago, but it's getting, it getting better now all around the world. And we have access to all those databases all around the world to, to try to have a better understanding of the, of the tumor we are dealing with every day. Um, and I think that's going to be uh, the future right now is how we analyze those big data um, for the future. Yeah, and apply and apply advanced techniques like machine learning and neural networks and exactly. artificial intelligence on all that massive amount of data. You know, there's a very interesting project ongoing throughout the Providence system that in, that involves 14 other large health systems to pull together the data on patients with brain tumors, other types of cancers and other disorders, a huge effort uh, called Truveta that's just been launched by Providence that holds a lot of potential to learn from the, all of that aggregated real world clinical data. Uh, but it takes, it takes uh, special talents, takes special techniques, to mine that data, to provide us with the new answers that are gonna to lead to more definitive cures. I think maybe not during my career, but during Dr. Barkadarian's career, we're, we're gonna be curing glioblastomas. Yeah, I feel like we're right, right there. We've made tremendous gains in the last several years in many cancers. And I think brain cancer is on the precipice of having that as well. And I think collaborating within the Providence Network um, is an immense uh, opportunity. And we are sharing this data so that we can come up with new strategies, new innovations um, along the way. You know, can I add one other thing? Yeah, brain cancer is the last frontier. It's the toughest of all. It's the location where metastatic tumors arrive that is the most difficult to treat. You know, if, if location is the most important thing in real estate,
then the most important real estate is the brain. And that's part of the challenge. Could I add one more thing, Neil? Please do. So um, one thing I think we do very well at the St. John's Cancer Institute is thinking outside the box and really coming at a problem from a different angle, especially when we know our, our traditional approaches haven't worked. So one example of this is photodynamic therapy. And I mentioned the dyes that we use in the operating room to find the tumor. Well, what some researchers have identified is with the right light setting, they can actually kill the tumor. And some other researchers have figured out that you can actually activate those dyes with ultrasound. And so it's possible that down the line, we may be able to take care of these tumors with this dye and ultrasonic energy, which we have the capabilities to do so and target these tumors in a completely different way than we're doing right now. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's really coming down the pike in brain cancer treatment options. You know, if we can break up a kidney stone without an incision with ultrasound, I think we can kill brain tumors. That's an, that's a, that's a that's a, a good a good thought, and the and dyes that are taken up preferentially by the tumor and spare the normal brain, dyes that activate this kind of energy, that's an exciting prospect. Well. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists for a very uh, interesting discussion today. I learned quite a bit. I, I'm, 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 every day I'm more enthusiastic about the work that we're doing together here. And I wonder if, uh, if Jean has any final comments. I do, and thank you very much, Dr. Martin. I, you know, thank you to all the panelists. This was um, again just like an incredible, um, you know, amount of information, wonderful information for all of us to learn. And um, just thank you for your time uh, and your passion in doing what you do. It's it's incredible. Um, you know, so much of this work would not be possible without our without philanthropic support for our clinical trials at our research programs. So. You know, when I hear uh, Dr. Wazinski talking about um, the nanostring, which was a piece of equipment that was was bought uh, through a gift given to our melanoma program, you know, it's now being used for brain cancer, and I'm sure so many other cancers. It's a you know, these philanthropic gifts make a difference not just for a particular cancer, but for all of the research that we're doing, or the bioinformatics database that Dr. Wazinski was talking about. I mean, we've been we've got one of the largest bioinformatics databases, maybe certainly in the country, maybe in the world, and it's been there. We've had it at uh, our cancer institute for 30 plus years. So um, this is all philanthropically supported, and and so thank you for considering how you may help to support our work. Um, and we also just wanted to say we've got more webinars coming up. We hope that you will uh, join us for these future webinars. In June, we're going to be talking about the survivorship umbrella, uh, survivorship mentoring and cancer supportive care at St. John's Health Center at the St. John's Cancer Institute. Uh, so we're really looking forward to that. In July, prostate cancer, actors, active surveillance, and early stage treatment with our, our incredible um, team uh, that works in prostate cancer. Uh, so that, that's going to be a fantastic webinar also. And in August, uh, melanoma and cutaneous skin cancer updates. We've got um, a new uh, melanoma medical oncologist who's just joined our team this week. And uh, we are so looking forward to hearing about the work that she is going to be doing in the clinical trials. So thank you for being here. Um, and we look forward to seeing you next next month. Yeah, Jean, if I, can, if I can just say one final thing, you know, if if we're not able to help um, any of the people on the on the webinar or their family members or friends personally, um, you can be confident that the work coming out of our clinical trials and our laboratories is going to be uh, uh, contributing to the knowledge that's going to help drive their therapy. So if there's anything we can do to help anybody, uh, please let us know. And uh, we'll be praying for any of, the, any of the people in the audience who are struggling with this disease or any of your family members. Thank you. Thank you.